I have the uh, distinct pleasure of talking to you this afternoon about uh, two, actually two, you get a bonus for two, two of Minneapolis's 19th century uh, breweries, which combines two of my interests, uh, archaeology and beer. Um, and it seems fitting since we have a celebratory topic today that we throw some beer into the mix. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the three breweries that dominated the Twin Cities during the 20th century. In St. Paul, overlooking Sweet Hollow, Hams, the beer refreshing from the land of sky blue waters. And Schmidt, the brew that grew with the great Northwest. While over in Minneapolis, we have Grain Belt, the friendly beer with the friendly flavor. <laughs> All three are uh, Minnesota icons, and, um, but it's the Grain Belt that we'll be focusing on today. Despite the brewery having closed its doors in 1975, Grain Belt continues to be, and its red diamond logo, continue to be a part of our cultural landscape. From the dominating presence of the beautifully rehabilitated brew house building in Northeast Minneapolis, to the iconic neon sign on Nicollet Island, to the beer itself, which is still available on your local brewery store shelf, uh, now brewed in Wall by the August, brew August Shell Brewing Company, uh, Minnesota's oldest uh, brewery that's still in operation. Fewer may realize that behind the iconic Grain Belt label and its 20th century success was a consortium of four 19th century Minneapolis breweries. In the face of inroads being made into the local market by out-of-state breweries, the Orth, Germania, Heinrich, and Nuremberg businesses joined forces in 1890 to form the Minneapolis Brewing and Malting Company, a business that in 1967 would officially change its locally connotative name to that of its principal product, Grain Belt. Down the lower right, you'll see that I included the Glick Brewery, Minneapolis' second oldest commercial brewery, and the only brewery in the city to not join in the brewery merger reindeer games. It's the archaeological remains of two of the Grain Belt Four, that's how we refer to them around the office, the Grain Belt Four. It's two of the Grain Belt Four that we're going to focus our attentions on today, the Orth and Germania. I should note that of the other two uh, Grain Belt predecessors, the Heinrich Brewery was the subject of archaeological investigations during the 1980s uh, as part of the West River Parkway project, and it's likely that portions of that brewery site are still preserved. The Nuremberg, unfortunately, is mostly lost to us. Uh, the site of the brewery after its closure was actually quarried for stone. For a period of time after the merger, the Minneapolis Brewing Company's production relied on the brewery complex of its, of its four formative companies, some longer than others, until it completed the construction of the new facility at the Orth location in 1892. The following year, the Minneapolis Brewing Company launched its signature brand, Golden Grain Belt. By 1901, the company was producing at an annual capacity of 500,000 barrels, making it one of two leading producers of beer in the state. While its primary post-prohibition market was the upper Midwest, its distribution extended to the West Coast, to Alaska, and by 1960, annual production had increased 800,000 barrels. Grainbelt Breweries went on to become a dominant regional brewer and the 18th largest brewer in the U.S., reaching an annual capacity of 2 million barrels before a combination of circumstances forced the brewery to close in 1975. At the time of the 1890 merger, it is unlikely that any of the original four breweries could have conceived of the future success of Grain Belt, or in particular, that German immigrant John Orth could have imagined the rise of the Minneapolis Brewing Company on the very site that he selected for his brewery in 1850. That year, Orth and his wife Mary came to St. Anthony, and by that December, Orth advertised in the Minnesota Democrat that he was, quote, now ready to supply the citizens of the territory with ale and beer making his the second commercial brewery in operation in the territory and the first to brew beer in Hennepin County. Orth located his brewery, initially a modest wood frame structure, on the east side of the Mississippi, just above Boom Island, on the corner of what is now Marshall and 13th Avenue Northeast, and Orth's brewery met with immediate success. The citizens of St. Anthony consumed the initial batch of beer in less than a month. By 1861, the original wood frame brewery had been replaced by a three-story brew house with a stone first story and wood frame upper stories. Orr steadily grew his brewery, and in 1875, teams of wagons were, quote, kept constantly going, delivering beer at the different saloons of the city and the depots, and at depots for shipments to points as far north as Breckenridge and as far south as the state line. Orr's beer was particularly, quote, in good demand in the Minnesota Valley, and it was often found impossible to fill the many orders from abroad. Uh, Orth himself, this is Orth right here, 
Uh, and you can see some of the beer wagons. I always love these photos because they have, here's a guy with a, holding a, a glass aloft and here's some other fellow sampling. <laughs> the brewery eventually expanded to encompass a large complex of structures on both sides of Marshall. Orth's sons took active roles in the brewery's leadership and when Orth passed away in 1887, they continued to operate the brewery with his wife Mary stepping in to the role of vice president. It was during this period that when son John W. Orth was in the, the leader of the, uh, the president of, the, uh, of Greenbelt, that the Minneapolis Brewing and Malting Company merger took place. The following year, construction began on a new facility at the Orth location with a magnificent new brew house, which would forever cement the association of Northeast Minneapolis with Greenbelt, being built on the opposite side of the street from the original Orth brewery and on the very corner where the Orth family home had actually once stood. So this is, this is where the Orth brewery was located. And I've, I've, I've read that the four sort of divisions of the facade actually represent the four breweries that merged to form Greenbelt. After the Greenbelt Brewery closed, the city of Minneapolis eventually purchased the property and undertook the Greenbelt Redevelopment Project. Because HUD support for aspects of the project was anticipated, the city entered into a programmatic agreement with the SHPO in 2000 to facilitate the Section 106 consultation process that this multi-phase, multi-year project would undergo. Initial archaeological investigations were carried out in 2000 and 2001 by Hemisphere Field Services. Their investigations focused on the remains of portions of the Orth Brewery to both the east and the west of Marshall Street. And their, their purpose, their sole intent in undertaking those investigations was, quote, the present to determine the presence or absence of the original historic brewery foundations and or basements intact under the present ground surface. Within the area of Orth's main brewery, Hemisphere selected as their target the stone foundations of a portion of the central brew house building. Through the excavation of three trenches in January of 2001, they identified foundations and floor segments on three sides of the supposed brew house. These excavations confirmed that foundations of the brewery building were, remained intact, and as a result, the site was recognized as a contributing element to the existing National Register listed Minneapolis Brewing Company Historic District. Hemisphere's report included a rectangle outlining the central brewery building that had been the target of their investigations, which in and of itself is not problematic, except that subsequent to the completion of their work, development plans only provided for the protection of that approximately 90 by 100 foot box, something that should make all of us consultants pause before we put a box on a map, because as you can see, the majority of the brewery complex is located outside of that box. And that's the thing about breweries. They are a complex. They are in, uh, comprised of a series of buildings all working together in tandem. As any home brewers in the audience know, the production of beer is a multi-phase process in which the natural sugars and barley are converted to alcohol through the action of yeast. Spaces within the brewery are devoted to each of the steps of the process, and while each brewery complex is made up of basically the same components, the capacity of those spaces and how they are arranged varies considerably as each brewer seeks that particular combination of efficiency and quality that will allow them to be set apart from the others. I don't have enough time today to go into the details of the brewing process, but briefly, barley is germinated and converted to malt, and that requires a malt kiln and a malt mill. The malt is extracted to brew and brewed with hops in the brew house, and then undergoes a two-part fermentation process, the first step often taking place in a dedicated fermentation house. And for German lagers, the second stage of fermentation takes place over the course of two months uh, at temperatures between 45 and 55 degrees, and that's why a lot of our breweries have associated brewery caves, that second stage fermentation was taking place in the caves. Orth uh, initially had a series of brewery caves that he excavated into the north end of Nicollet Island, but he later built a series of ice houses on his, on his property with subterranean cellars beneath them, and he felt that process produced a better beer. After aging and clarification, the finished beer is kegged, and kegs were cleaned and repaired on site and lined with pitch as needed. Uh, you can see the keg shed in the left, lower left-hand side of the photo, of the image. After, uh, during this period, breweries also maintained a stable of matched teams of horses and a fleet of beer wagons for delivering their product. I love this uh, advertisement uh, of the John Orth Brewing Company, which I owe uh, Doug Hoverson's book, Amber Waters, uh, for, 
for having it, for finding it, because it actually labels each of the structures in the, uh, in the image, uh, be, uh, including uh, views of both the interior and exterior of the stable, both of Orr's malt, malt houses, and even a detail of the hospitality tap room for workers and visitors, which is down here. Therefore, to preserve only the area of the brew house and a portion of the brew house at that is not the same as protecting and preserving the historical resource that is the Orth Brewery. Thankfully, the Minnesota Minneapolis HPC and the SHPO uh, took that into consideration. And in 2006, in anticipation of the sale and development of the parcel, they requested that an archaeologist document the exact location, depth below grade, and dimensions of the Orth Brewery foundations, particularly the location of the previously undefined east wall, which was going to be the most proximate to the development. It seemed like a pretty straightforward job to us. Go in, relocate the previously identified foundations, and expand from there to locate the corners of the building. In fact, the trenches from, that were from six years ago were still visible on the surface of the parking lot. But when we opened up our first trench, it became clear that something was amiss. What had appeared to archaeologists in January of 2001 as a foundation was actually a cut through the stone and lime floor of the interior of the brewery's main floor that had been created by a 20th century utility trench. This meant that not only did the avoidance box not encompass the entirety of the brewery, but it didn't even encompass the central brew house. Through additional trenching, we identified the four corners of the brew house, as well as additional features of the brewery complex, including a previously unidentified uh, or undocumented uh, foundation to the northeast of the brew house that does not appear on either of the available Sanborn insurance maps. We also identified elements of the boiler room, the malt kiln, and an ice house. Excavations generally did not go deeper than what was necessary to expose and record the foundation so as not to disturb the intact cultural deposits surrounding them. Based on these findings, the site boundary was revised and the protection box was expanded to encompass the entirety of the Orth Brewery. While the 2006 development never came to pass, this recent, this, just this past March, the city of Minneapolis entered into a new de redevelopment agreement for the parcel that encompasses the site of the Orth Brewery. As previously mentioned, the brewery is recognized as a contributing resource to the National Register District, and the bid packet prepared by the city included the Orth Brewery Archaeology Report together with this new map uh, of the area of avoidance encompassing the entire remains of the Orth Brewery. The city's development guidelines for the parcel call for the continued protection of the site through the creation of a brewery square, a public open space on that corner. I think the, the truly surprising thing about the Orth Brewery is that it has survived. Not only survived, but it's incredibly well preserved. From in situ nails indicating locations of former wood elements of the brewery building to the coal soot stained brick paved floors where men once stood stoking the, boilers, the brewer's boilers, to the smooth line of the growing, lime of the growing floor on which barley once began its journey to becoming beer. The site actually has excellent integrity that in the midst of the expanding Grain Belt Brewery complex on a parcel shared at one time with industrial warehouse and its loading dock, that the site area continued to be used as a parking lot, thus preserving the site just inches, it's literally just inches below the, uh, the surface of the lot, is a truly uh, amazing process. While the Orth Brewery was well known and well documented contributing resource to an existing district, the same cannot be said of our next brewery. In 2010, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board contracted Two Pines to undertake a phase one archeological survey in anticipation of planned improvements in the park. The project was receiving a permit from the Corps, and as part of the Section 106 review process, the SHPO recommended that an archeological survey be undertaken prior to construction. I should note that uh, Andrea Vermeer was the PI on this project, but she's kindly letting me share her findings today. Um, as part of our standard pre-field work literature search, the available historical maps of the project area reviewed. Unfortunately, Worth Park straddles the border between Minneapolis and Golden Valley, and as such, it's in a bit of a cartographic black hole. Our initial search, though, did produce this intriguing 1898 map of a portion of the park showing a surprising number of structures, including several large buildings on a 10-acre parcel to the east of Worth Lake, then referred to as Keegan's Lake, owned by the Minneapolis Brewing Company. Those familiar with Worth Park, the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden, and the Quaking Bog know that the park presents an aura of natural and rural spaces, rolling hills and wooded glens, not industrial complexes. Further research into the archives at MHS produced a single rasher fire insurance map. Uh, there is no pre-1900 Sanborn map coverage for this area. And on this, it was the uh, buildings were identified as the Germania Brewery, Minneapolis Brewing and Multi Companies Branch Number Four. Each of the four received a branch number after the merger. While this map is not as detailed as the Sanborn maps of the Orth Brewery, it does give us a general sense of the brewery's arrangement. 
The northernmost component was a two-story ice house, of, um, of which, and then there was a central five-story section constituting the tallest part of the building and flanked on the east and west by a four-story section. None of these buildings, that portion of the building is not labeled as a function, but it was likely used for grain storage. The central portion consisted of the main brew house with a three-story section on the west, uh, which housed the artesian well, and then a central four-story section within which was a bo the boiler room, and another three-story section to the east. The southernmost portion of the building was primarily a three-story ice house, east of which was a one-story coal shed. Unfortunately, the only available rasher map had re been revised between 1892 and 1904, and during the revision, portions of the brewery complex were masked out. We have not yet been able to uh, locate an original version of the 1892 volume, so keep your eye out for, for one. The Germania Brewery was the last of the Grain Belt Four to go into operation and was the shortest lived. The five-story brewery was built in 1887 and was closed just three years later when the Minneapolis Brewing Company merger took place. The Germania reportedly manufactured under 2,000 barrels of beer per year. However, during its brief period of operation, the brewery took full advantage of its lakeside setting, also operating a resort a summer beer garden, a specifically German drinking and recreational institution. The Germania Brewing Association's Germania Park included a, refresh, a, excuse me, a refreshment parlor, private dining rooms, a dance hall, and an adjacent bowling alley. An 1887 article describes the park with the adjectives charming, grace, hospitality, and first class. And perhaps initially Germania Park lived up to that image, but not long after the area gained a reputation for violence and attracting a seedy element prompting the Minneapolis Tribune to ask in 1892, is the Keegan's Lake District in no man's land or an independent principality, then it cannot be invaded by the police officers of the city of Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, or the United States of America? It is unclear if this reputation was gained during the brewery's period of operation or after its closure when the resort continued under different ownership. Nonetheless, when the brewery building and its associated hall were demolished in 1900, the Minneapolis Tribune focused on its attentions not on the brewery itself, but rather on the more sensational events that took place in the park and hall. Around the old brewery was a small park, while nearby a dance hall and bar were run at full capacity. Fights and drunken carousals were not uncommon occurrences, and the stories of what happened in the neighborhood shocked the decent citizens of Minneapolis. Just as there is only one detailed map of the Germania, we have found only one photograph of the brewery, and like the newspaper accounts, it too is focused on the dance hall in the foreground, although the mass of the brewery complex can be seen how, uh, here in the background. By 1901, public sentiment against the Keegan's Lake Resort was becoming more pronounced due to the disorderly conduct of its patrons, particularly with regard to the consumption of alcohol, which was facilitated by the resort's location outside of the Minneapolis city limits. Efforts to close down the resort and the surrounding saloons led to the Minneapolis Park Board's purchase of the land in 1909. So while Shippo had recommended a survey of the planned park improvements, particularly with the potential of Worth Lake area to contain evidence for early park development, uh, this newfound history brought a whole other element to our investigation. In fact, the construction of some of the most significant of the proposed park amenities were planned for the site of the former brewery. But really, a brewery in the middle of Worth Park the amount of earth-moving activity that took place during the park's initial period of construction was well documented. Bassett's Creek had been rerouted, wetlands filled, hills reshaped, so our, our hopes weren't that high. But uh, we went out and did some shovel testing, and in the second shovel test, we encountered the limestone foundation of the building's east wall. Not only were the remains of the brewery still there, but they were literally just below the sod. Additional shovel tests encountered other elements of the brewery, including a section of the brick paved floor of the boiler room. And you could see the grass, I mean, it was literally like just the shovel scoop below the surface. In fact, once we got our bearings, it was possible to sort of stand back and, and look around and see that elements of the brewery were still visible on the surface. Subsequent phase two unit excavation revealed additional intact portions of the brewery building, such as this segment of the West Foundation, complete with a builder's trench. And I just want to note this section of disturbed soil that I labeled park creation. That's evident throughout the park, uh, which is test, bears testimony to how much earth moving uh, took place during the initial park construction. We also found uh, artifact deposits dating to the period of the brewery's occupation and those wild times that followed after. Another unit we expanded on the previous shovel testing location that revealed more of the intact brick paving of the brewery's boiler room. This is actually a yellow bricked floor, so that's how much coal soot uh, is staining that uh, brick paving. And in this unit, a massive limestone footing for one of the brewery building's interior supports. Archaeological testing to the south of the brewery also revealed intact deposits in the vicinity of the former dance hall and bowling alley, as well as across the road at the site of the troublesome Heckrick Saloon. 
But as Worth Park removed these features from the landscape, the intervening century has wiped them from the collective public memory. The success of this transformation is illustrated by the presence of this 1937 WPA picnic table directly atop the remains of the former brewery. Daily dog walkers and joggers who stopped to chat with archaeologists in the midst of their park were truly surprised to learn about a brewery, dance halls and saloons, and even homes that once stood on either sides of stretches of Xerxes Avenue that has since been subsumed into the park. Like the Orth Brewery, the Germania is significant for its association with the Minneapolis brewing industry and as a predecessor of one of Minnesota's most important brewing complexes, Grain Belt. It also is added, has the added associated with the German Recreational Institution of the Summer Garden. Furthermore, it is eligible for information that contains regarding brewery operations, Germanic lifeways, and summer garden activities. The presence of the Germania brewery literally inches below the sod of Worth Park was unexpected and an excellent example of why we undertake the process that we do. Going forward, the Minneapolis Park Board is working with the Worth Park Citizens Advisory Committee to modify development plans and to avoid impacts to the site. So the next time you drink a drain belt, Green Belt Northeast or you drive across the Hennepin Avenue Bridge and see that iconic sign, I hope that you'll take a moment to reflect on the Green Belt Four and their legacy and the amazing preservation of these sites and how their continued protection will serve to document our state's earliest brewing heritage. Thank you.